All right, well, hopefully you remember the text I read because that is the text we're looking at. So let's begin by just an introduction on the book uh, before we get into introductory remarks that Paul gives as he introduces himself to the church at Rome. Now, again, the book of Romans, very, very familiar book. I mean, it's, it seems like this book hardly needs an introduction because all of us are familiar with it. I hope we've all read it. I think we should have, especially if we're in the reform camp. We know, you know, what an important book this is for us because it contains some pretty important chapters and statements, not the only books in the Bible that do. And there are things in the book, of course, that we have all wrestled with, and uh, we're going to wrestle with those things again because not everything it says is immediately clear, but I think we can all say that we all love and appreciate this book uh, because this book, perhaps above all others in the New Testament, gives us such a thorough explanation of the gospel. Uh, Paul tells us in this book, really, uh, as we kind of go through the book, it follows this sort of a pattern. First of all, why we need the gospel. That, that's very, very important. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we share the gospel of what Jesus Christ has done, and we leave out the important part of why we need it. Well, Paul explains that because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, because there is no one good, not even one. There is nobody who seeks after God. Uh, we are in a lost and fallen condition. We need a Savior. Paul goes on to tell us what God has done to provide salvation or to provide this gospel. He sent His Son into the world while we were still His enemies. And Jesus went to the cross, as I've already said, to pay for our sins. He tells us how we receive this mercy. We receive it like Abraham, who believed God's promise, and it, God reckoned it to, to him as righteousness. Now, it doesn't mean that God looked at Abraham's faith and said, Abraham, that's a good thing that you have faith. So I am going to credit your faith as righteousness to you, and that's what's going to save you. No, no, that's not what, what he's saying at all. But what he's saying is that he trusted in the Christ who was coming, and because of that faith, God credited to him the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that's how he was saved. And that's how we are saved. Now, Paul goes on to talk about how we can know that we are saved. It's when we're no longer married to the law of God, you know, in order to be justified or condemned by it, but rather we are married to Christ, we are in Christ, and in Christ receive His perfect righteousness, His obedience, His cleansing from sin. When we are no longer under the power of sin, we no longer are the slaves of sin and obey it, but we're walking according to the Spirit, following the Spirit, living in His power. Now, he tells us other things as well, such as how our salvation, our Gentile salvation, is a part of God's plan to provoke the Jews to jealousy, and also how we are to live now that we have received this grace. Essentially, Paul tells us everything that he would want us to know if we had never heard the gospel before, which means this book contains everything we need to tell other people as we seek to lead them to Christ. It's a thorough explanation of the gospel. Now, before we look at Paul's introduction, as I said before, let's begin with some preliminary matters. First of all, who wrote the book? Well, that part, thankfully, is obvious. It was Paul the Apostle. He clearly identifies himself in verse 1. But let's not forget, as we read this book, that even though these words were penned by the apostle and they are 100% what he intended to write, at the same time, this work was superintended by the Holy Spirit so that what he wrote is precisely what God wanted him to write. This is the Word of God. Secondly, to whom it is written? Paul tells us in verse 7, to the church in Rome. Now, we don't, you know, I think we mentioned before as we were, you know, perhaps looking, I forget exactly what the context was now, but we know that from the book of Acts that this book was not established by Paul, I mean, excuse me, this, this church. We, we don't actually know how it was established. Paul tells us that he had not yet been to Rome. That's what he's talking about in his introduction. And there's no mention in this letter or any of the other New Testament letters of any other apostles having been there. It's most likely that it was established by uh, 
Jews who went to one of the three annual feasts, in this particular case, the Feast of Pentecost, when the Lord poured out of His Holy Spirit, and we might say the New, church, the New Testament church was, was born. You know, uh, when the, the promise that Jesus had given of the Father was poured out upon them, there were many Jews that were saved on that particular day. I believe it was 3,000. And many of them had come from other places of the empire. And they stayed there for a while, and they were discipled, and some of them were undoubtedly from Rome. And then they went back and established this, this church. Now, it's clear that this church had been established sometime earlier when Paul writes, because he writes in verse 8 that their faith was already known throughout the entire world. It takes a little while for that to happen. At the end of the, or excuse me, at the time of this letter, the majority of the believers appear to have been Gentiles, and I think that's important, um, and we'll look at that as we, as we go through the introduction. Apparently, these Jews, remember Jews were very bigoted against Gentiles, but they understood that God was now including all the nations within His household, and so as soon as they got to Rome, they began reaching out to everyone around them. And apparently, a great number of Gentiles were saved. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell whether Paul's writing to Jews or Gentiles. I, he was writing to both. They were both present in the church, but it appears as though they were predominantly Gentiles. Third, when was the book written? Well, Paul composed it sometime before his trip to Jerusalem, which is what we saw at the end of the book of Acts. We read in Romans 15, verses 25 through 26, this, But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Now, remember, we saw this towards the end of the book of Acts. This is why Paul made that last trip to Jerusalem. He had collected this gift from the Gentile churches they had shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, and so he says they ought to share in your material blessings. Uh, this was the money, the gift that, that Paul was, was bringing, and it's the money that Festus, remember, was hoping that Paul would use to buy his freedom, which is why he called and talked with him often. If you, well, if you weren't here for that series in, in Acts, uh, uh, sorry, but uh, hopefully it sounds familiar. So he likely wrote it while he was still at Corinth uh, on his third missionary journey, sometime between 55 and 57 A.D. I believe we saw that his imprisonment was around 61, 62 A.D. Now, finally, his purpose in writing this, this letter. Since this church had been established without any direct apostolic involvement, Paul wanted to make sure that they were grounded in the truth of the gospel. Now, we have to be thankful for this, don't we? The Lord sovereignly arranged this situation, that the Roman church would be there without being established by an apostle, so that Paul would write this letter, so that his church, that is the Lord's church, that, so that we would have this explanation of the gospel. And again, it is the most thorough explanation we have, and it, it contains some very important things that we wouldn't have that insight if it had not been for this situation that Paul writes in. So again, this is God's sovereignty. This is his, uh, his plan to give us this information, to build this foundation for his church. Now this morning, with the time we have remaining, let's just consider the introductory remarks uh, as Paul introduces himself and as he says something about his desires to come to them to share the gospel. So first of all, he begins with some introductory remarks, introducing himself. First, how he viewed his relationship with Jesus. I hope you noted where he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. You know, that word I'm sure we've heard a lot about literally means slave, okay? Someone who is at the complete disposal of another person who basically belongs to him. In this case, he belongs to Christ. Now, from what we've seen in the book of Acts, that was certainly true of Paul, wasn't it? There was nothing he wouldn't do for his Lord. There was nothing he wouldn't risk. There was no price he refused to pay. Remember all the times he suffered. One time we believe he was even killed and then <clears throat> raised again to life. 
Uh, Paul gives basically a catalog of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians. And it doesn't look like the kind of life any of us would want to live. But Paul gloried in it because he was doing this for his Lord and every, every beating, every stoning, everything he suffered was for his glory, but he did it as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, the fact that he was the slave of Christ, the bondservant, uh, was not unique to him. And it wasn't unique to the apostles. Paul will later in the book of Romans call us also the slaves of Christ. And we should think about the implications of that for our lives. Now, before we react too strongly, and perhaps if we find it objectionable, we do need to remember that this is not forced slavery, okay? This is voluntary on our part. Nobody forced Paul to submit to Jesus. Nobody forced Jesus to submit to his Father. They both did this because they loved, okay? And if we love the Father and we love the Son, which we do by His Holy Spirit living within us if we're trusting in Christ, then we can't really help but do the same thing. You know, you are the, you're basically the slave of whatever it is you love, right? Whatever is in your heart, that's, I've been thinking about that recently, you know, that everything that tears our affections away from the Lord, we need to get rid of those things because they're idols. He needs to be first because we are the slaves of that which we love the most, but it's a voluntary slavery. We give ourselves to the one whom we love. That's what Paul did. Now next, he points to his divine credentials. Verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. An apostle, as we know, is an official messenger of the gospel. One personally set apart by Christ, to be his representative. And again, from the book of Acts, we saw Jesus, you know, coming to Paul and calling him personally when he was on the road to Damascus, remember, to, to capture and imprison and drag back to Jerusalem every Christian that he might find there. It was there that he was converted. Now, it's, impo it's important that his audience know who he is because they've never really met Paul before but they do need to recognize the authority with which he writes. Now, again, they need to examine everything that Paul says according to the Scriptures like the Bereans, but yet he did write with an authority. What he was writing was the Word of God, and of course, as they compared those things, they would discover that to be true. So Paul, again, this is his introduction. I am the slave of Christ. I am his, one of his apostles. Next, he introduces the gospel for which he was set apart. First, as the fulfillment of what God had promised through His prophets in the Scriptures, specifically regarding His Son, Jesus, who, according to His human nature, was born in the line of David. Okay, he points that out, showing that, again, the Jews understood, and perhaps these Gentiles did by this time, that this one who was the Messiah was predicted was going to be the son of David. He had to have the right to the Davidic throne, okay? So that's why he had to be born in this line, but who was also declared the Son of God to be divine with power when the Spirit of God raised him from the dead. You know, we think about the resurrection as, you know, Jesus was dead and now he's alive again. And now that he's alive, he can, he can be our Savior. But we need to see there's a lot more to the resurrection than just this. Okay, the resurrection is the Father's vindication of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, of everything He claimed about Himself and everything that He did. What is it that Jesus claimed? Well, He claimed to be the Son of God, you know, the eternal Son of God. He claimed to be the Son of Man, which means not that He claimed to be a human being, but He claimed to be the Messiah. That's what the title Son of Man means. And also, it was a vindication of everything that He said that He came into the world to do. I mean, what, what did He say He came to do? To take away sins and to reconcile to God all who trust in Him, to justify them. Um, when God raised him from the dead, he was basically saying this man was no, uh, was no phony, he was no charlatan, but he is who he said he was, and he has done what he said he has done, and this 
is the father saying, this is my divine approval. I remember in seminary, one of my professors saying that the resurrection is also Jesus' justification. You know, not in just in the sense of vindicating who he was and what he had done, but this was his justification or his being declared righteous by his father. And I thought that's an awfully strange thing. Why did Jesus need to be justified? And this sounded to me almost heretical. But what he meant by this was this, that Jesus suffered and died because of our sins, okay? Our sins were credited to him, were laid upon him, and he paid the penalty. The penalty of that was suffering, God's wrath, and dying. So he was basically under the curse of our sins. But the resurrection meant that his suffering and his death actually paid for those sins so that the guilt was removed. And once they were paid for, death could no longer hold him. And so what he meant by this is that this was the Father's declaration that his payment was enough and that those sins had been discharged and now Jesus was freed from death. And I think you can see the importance of that for us because if Jesus had not been freed from death, that means that our sins that killed him were still not paid for and we would still be in our sins. That's what Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15. The resurrection is very, very important. At the same time, Paul is telling us here that Jesus had to be both God and man. He had to be man to take our place in the judgment. We are the ones who owed the debt. But he also had to be God so that he could survive making the payment. Remember, God's wrath was poured out against him. That would have disintegrated any mere mortal. The fact that he was God allowed him to survive, but it also elevated the value of the, of the price that he paid so that he could pay for our infinite debt to God's justice. Now, Paul says this is who Christ is, and this is the one who also extended his mercy even more towards him in calling him to the work of bringing this gospel to the Gentiles that they also might serve him. By the way, I should mention, there's a lot of things in this introduction, so I hope, you know, I hope we can see the relevance of each part of it. I just wanted to touch on each part of it. Pointing to the Roman believers, Paul writes this, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Okay, among whom? Among the Gentiles, okay? This is the one that, you know, Paul was set apart in order to bring the, the gospel to the Gentiles. This is one of the reasons why we believe the church at Rome was primarily made up of Gentiles. I was sent to the Gentiles, among whom you are the called of Jesus Christ. He refers to them as the called, those who had been reached with the gospel, with the outward call of the gospel, but also with the inward call, that is the inward call of the Holy Spirit that quickens them to life so that they could respond in faith and repentance. It's because of what he says in verse 7. It's to these he writes, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as or called to be saints. Okay, so Paul is addressing this letter to those who have been called by the Lord Jesus Christ, to those who are beloved of God in Rome, called by God to be saints. In other words, these are some of the, what the Bible calls the elect. Okay, these are the, the sheep. These are those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, these introductions to these letters are very important. I think you'll find that in each case they are addressed to the saints, aren't they? to those who have actually trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ or those at least who are professing to trust in Him, who perhaps on a judgment of charity are considered to be Christians because they're professing faith in Christ, because they're members of the church. But really everything that Paul writes about you know, God's promise and, and the benefits of the gospel and what happens for everyone who trusts Him really only applies to those who actually do trust in Him. Now, I think when most people pick up the Bible and they read these letters, they tend to think that the Bible is written to the whole world. It says, you know, Paul says, well, God loves you and He sent Christ for you and you're righteous in Christ. We think, well, this, you know, we know that it can't refer to everyone. 
But we, we tend to take things in these letters as though they are addressed to the world, as though everything it says applies to everyone. But you know, there is a particular audience, a particular you know, destination, that, you know, a group of people that Paul is actually addressing himself to. And we see here clearly that it is those who are called, to those who are beloved of God, to those who are in this relationship with God. So it's not addressed to the world. It is addressed to believers, though we understand some of the things that are said in this letter actually do apply to unbelievers, particularly the opening chapters that speak about our situation as we come into the world before the Lord had mercy on us. So one thing to recognize is this, that everything that Paul writes here, if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, it applies to us because if we're trusting Christ, we are called, we are beloved, we are saints that is, the holy ones, because we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul writes to them, and he, he gives his, his common apostolic greeting, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which, of course, is something that the Lord has given to us already. He has given to us that unmerited gift, that unmerited favor that comes through faith in Christ, um, and he has given to us peace, peace with God and peace with one another. Now, quickly, Paul moves to, his, you know, he next he points to the prayers and his desires on their behalf. First of all, how he thanked God for them. Remember, because their faith had become known throughout the world, God had given them the evidence that they truly did come to know him. He had given them an active faith They weren't Christians in name only. They weren't just those who say, I believe these things are true. I prayed the prayer. But they were living the Christian life. Their faith could be seen in the things that they were doing. Now, again, this reminds us that it's one thing to say that we trust in Christ. And everybody who joins the church basically says, I love Jesus. I'm trusting Jesus. I'm going to obey Jesus. But it's another thing actually to trust Him. And again, the difference really can only be seen in how it is that we live. Is our faith visible? Okay. Remember what James wrote in James 2.18 when he's challenging his imaginary objectors? Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. What he's saying here is that if you have saving faith, that faith will be visible. It, It transforms your life. Faith responds to the Bible uh, in the way that, that the Lord would have us to. If He says, do this, we do it. If He says, I made this promise to you, we believe this promise. It makes a difference in the way that we live. The world, in this case, could see the works that their faith produced. That's why their faith was being proclaimed throughout the entire world. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 10, We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That means when people look at us, they should be able to see our faith by our works. Second, Paul tells them how much he prays for them, specifically that God might allow him to visit them. He wanted to make sure, he tells us in verse 11, that they were established in the faith. Again, the reason why he was writing this letter, and he wanted to use the gift that God had given him to this end. Now, that's what he means when he says he wanted to come to them and he wanted to impart to them some spiritual gift. I remember my days back uh, in in charismatic circles where we we heard that what, what this meant was that Paul had to go there to lay hands on them so they could receive the Spirit and they could get charismatic gifts. But that's not really what Paul's talking about here, though undoubtedly that took place during that time frame. He wanted to take the gift that God had given to to him, and he wanted to build them up with it in Christ. He says he also wanted them to use their gifts to build him up, particularly their faith. He writes in verse 11, that I may be encouraged with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith both yours and mine. 
Now, he appears to have in mind here the kind of encouragement that we can give to each other. You know, when we get together and we, we worship, when we get together and we fellowship, and when that fellowship is particularly in the things of the Lord, when we are, are faithful to gather for worship because we, we love Him, when we believe God's promises, when we're going through difficult times and people can see that we're really trusting in the Lord, um, when we hear what He says in His Word, what He wants us to do, and, and we obey it because we really do want to please Him, okay? This not only benefits us, but it's an encouragement to everyone around us. Faith is not just a blessing to us because we're saved by, by grace through faith, but it's meant to be a blessing to others, isn't it? You know, we're not supposed to be secret Christians, you know, private religion. Don't talk to me about Christ. That's a very personal thing. We're supposed to be open about it and share the love of Christ with others and share our faith with others and how much we love Him, how much we trust Him, and basically show one another that we are believers by the way we live. Well, that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to build them up. He wanted to be built up because when you get together with Christians who are sincerely seeking the Lord, it is very encouraging. There, there's really no greater um, pleasure on earth uh, than, than that. Now, Paul goes on to say that he had planned to come to them on more than one occasion, but the Lord had prevented him. It wasn't yet his time. God has his perfect timing for everything. He wanted to come not only for the mutual encouragement, but he also wanted to come, he says, that he might evangelize. Evangelize the Gentiles, bring even more of them into the church. And we noted, I think it was last, I don't know if it was last time, but it was um, probably the, the second to the last sermon in the book of Acts, that when Paul came to Rome, the Roman Christians came to visit him, and he was able to have that encouragement with them, but he was also able to reach out. Do you know that the Praetorian Guard, who were, again, Caesar's, basically his private army, they all heard about the faith of Paul. He was not, you know, again, being a Christian in a corner. And we read that many in Caesar's household had actually come to faith in Christ. Everywhere Paul went, he says, he saw himself under an obligation to share the gospel. Now, we know that this was a stewardship that Jesus had placed on him to bring the gospel to others, but we also know it was a labor of love from the heart. He said he wanted to bring the gospel to Greeks and to barbarians. And we kind of got introduced to that last time. Remember how the Jews divide the whole human race between two groups of people, Jews and non-Jews, okay? You're either part of our family or you're not. Well, Jews and Gentiles. Well, the Greeks divided all of mankind into two groups as well. The Greeks and the barbarians, okay? If, you're, if you speak our language, the common tongue, you're a Greek. But if you don't, you're a barbarian. It doesn't mean that you're you know, some wildly crazy group of people. It just means that you don't speak that language. Well, Paul said that he had come to bring the gospel to both Greeks and to barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish, that is, those who were the schooled or the learned and those who were unlearned. Paul was under obligation to bring the gospel to everyone. And so he says in verse 15, he was eager to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome. Now again, as you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, I think if you think of the world's greatest evangelists who have ever lived, you know, who would you say is the greatest evangelist, right? Some people are only familiar perhaps with, with D.L. Moody. He was a great evangelist. Certainly Spurgeon was a great evangelist. We know George Whitfield was a tremendous, and George, uh, John Wesley. But I think the Apostle Paul uh, stands out above everyone as far as, you know, the breadth of his ministry, the effectiveness of his ministry, and so forth. He was eager to preach the gospel. He was eager to share this message with other people. There wasn't anyone he wouldn't share it with. You see, this is the kind of heart that Jesus had. Although his ministry was pretty much limited to the Jews, he did actually talk to a couple of Gentiles during his ministry, but he was sent primarily to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He went to the entire world. But again, what did they have in common? They both 
loved God. Of course, Jesus is God in human flesh. He loved his Father and served him. Paul loved his Lord and served him. And he wanted, they both wanted to share that message with other people. This is the kind of heart, again, the Lord wants us to have. Not only a willingness to share the gospel, well, I'll do it if the situation presents itself, but an eagerness. You see, Paul, he sought those opportunities. He, he tried to open those doors. He didn't just wait for people to ask him, although that's, that's legitimate too, we know. You know. And people should be asking us. Or what Peter says in the passage we're using for our evening text, you know, be ready to give an answer for everyone who asks you for the hope that is within you. Yet with gentleness and reverence, why would they ever ask us that question? Well, it's because we're living openly as Christians and we're eagerly sharing, you know. Well, why do you believe that? We need to be ready to, to answer that question, but it's not going to come unless we can have this kind of eagerness. And really, what's stopping us? It's us, okay? It's, it's, it's sin. It's the flesh. It's, it's that weakness in us that we have to overcome and put to death. Now, again, asking why was Paul so eager? Well, he was eager because he was under obligation as a steward, as we've seen. But it's also because he loved Jesus and wanted to see his sheep gathered in. And he knew that the gospel was the only way that could be done. Okay, remember what Jesus says in John 10, 27 to the Jews. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Okay, how is it that the sheep hear the voice of Christ? They, well, in those days, Jesus spoke and they listened. But during Paul's day, how, how did they hear it? In our day, how do they hear the voice of Christ? The only way they can hear it is through the gospel. That's what Paul is telling us here in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This is how Jesus speaks. This is what the Spirit of God uses to change hearts, okay? The account of what Jesus did to save sinners and how people can come to know Him through faith. The simple message. This is something that we should not be ashamed of either. Because this and this alone is what the Lord uses to save individuals. Now, Paul says he sent it first to the Jew. We know that God made this promise to the Jew. So Israel had to be the first to receive news of its fulfillment. That's why Jesus goes to Palestine and he ministers within the bounds of Palestine. But then it goes to the Greek as well. When the, the Jews rejected it, God sent it to the Gentiles, as we're going to see in the book of Romans, in order to provoke them to jealousy. But the point is, and this, this we want to close with, it's only through the gospel that we can be made right with God. The gospel teaches us that we are not saved, we are not you know, recommended to God, we don't make ourselves acceptable to God through the things that we do. We cannot clean up our act. Okay? We, we can't really obey the Lord to the degree that He wants us to obey Him. We can't. We have to be perfect. But even if we could, what are we going to do with the guilt of all that failure that's behind us? How could we get rid of it? You see, we could never do that through the things that we do. That's why God sent a Savior into the world. That's why He sent Jesus Christ, who lived perfect life and died on the cross to pay for sins so that He might make us acceptable to Him. As the Lord says, through Habakkuk in the Old Testament, but the righteous shall live by faith. And what he means by that is they will survive, they will have eternal life through faith, but they will also live in, in faith, in trusting the Lord, in walking in His ways. But again, that first truth, that's the great truth of the Lord revealed to Luther, remember, during the, the Reformation that transformed his life. And that started the Reformation because Luther was under the impression very distinctly and even in the Augustinian uh, monastery, who they should have known better, that he had to be good enough for God to accept him, but he was never good enough, and so he always felt condemned. And it wasn't until he understood this passage that the Lord, as it were, opened the gates of paradise to him. He felt his sins removed and his acceptance with God as he saw it was in the Lord Jesus Christ.
and in him alone. That's the great truth of the gospel. Now, that's what Paul's going to explain to us in great detail in the book of Romans. Next week, he's going to begin his presentation where we should also begin, and that is why the whole human race is guilty before him, uh, the condition that they're in, why they could never possibly save themselves. That's the condition we were in before the Lord came to us in his grace and his mercy. But again, the gospel is the way we, we escaped it. That's why we love it, and that's why we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Well, let's, let's think about these things. And again, as we prepare to come to the table this morning, let's remember that Jesus, this, this is a representation of really his whole life, but primarily his death. Jesus had to die in order for us to be saved. If God would send his son into the world to give his life, could there be any other possible way? You know, Pelagius, remember as we were looking at this, I think it was on a Wednesday, Pelagius, a monk who lived during the time of Augustine, said that Adam just gave us a bad example. Jesus gives us a good example. We just need to follow the example Jesus gave us. We, you know, well, if that's true, why did Jesus go to the cross? If there was salvation in any other way, why would God have put his son through such suffering, through such misery, and even death, if we could come in some other way? Well, we can't. That's the only way. So let's think about that as we prepare to come to the table this morning. So let's spend just a few moments in silent prayer asking that the Lord might apply these things to us and that he would prepare us to come to the table.